Hi, I'm Josh Taylor. I'm a training associate here at VCU's Autism Center for Excellence. Uh, and I'm going to talk today about some tips for including students with autism in general education classes. So to give you a little bit of my background, uh, before I joined the team here at VCU, I worked as an autism specialist in Arlington Public Schools, and my background is really in the, in the classroom. I was a special education teacher. And I started in a, uh, a separate day school, so still a public school, uh, but for kids that were totally separate, uh, didn't have much interaction with typical peers. And uh, when working there, the, uh, the group, uh, the classroom team and I, uh, really worked to kind of uh, provide the first inclusive opportunities for those kids uh, in that school. Um, and then I also worked in a high school, which was a, uh, an inclusive program and really designed for kids uh, that were uh, at or above grade level and needed some support with organizational skills, behavioral skills, social skills. So really kind of, um, you know, we, we talk a lot about the spectrum and we'll kind of uh, complicate that a little bit in the talk today. Um, but, you know, uh, in those two experiences worked with different types of students. And so I'll draw from those experiences and talking about how we can provide inclusive opportunities and provide structure uh, for both our uh, really super smart, uh, bright, Sheldon kind of kids that uh, need some support, but not necessarily academically, more with the social and behavioral stuff, and also for our students with autism that are working on adapted curriculum and um, maybe more need more intensive support with communication or adapting instruction and things like that. Um, so this is kind of our outline of what I'll talk about today, and it's pretty straightforward. We'll talk about you know, why inclusion uh, is needed and why we need to think about giving special supports to students with autism, and kind of what about autism um, creates uh, differences that maybe we need to consider and uh, provide services for in a general education classroom and some ways that we can do that. Um, it also, uh, we're going to look at kind of breaking down those uh, supports that we can give students into kind of three steps. And, and these are uh, not scientific, these are kind of made up, but really just breaking down, you know, planning for inclusion, the stuff we need to do before kids get there, uh, preparing for success is really once the kids get to the classroom, kind of what we need to do to make sure that environment and that routine is set up for their success, and then problem solving, because we know things are going to come up, we're going to run into snags, and how can we support kids working through those things? Uh, so I want to start with a story, uh, and this is kind of a story of one of the first kiddos that I worked with uh, before I even moved to Virginia, back in Tennessee, where I'm from, and, uh, and this was a kiddo that I uh, supported as a substitute teacher, actually, and she was uh, super brilliant. Uh, she was in all of all general education classes, she was the smartest kiddo in her classroom, um, but she was a little bit different from her, her peers. She was uh, into show tunes. She had a beautiful voice, and her two favorite things in the world were uh, singing show tunes and tater tots. And uh, so she was, um, you know, very popular in her class and always knew all the answers. Um, but she also got frustrated when things didn't go the way she thought they would or when things changed unexpectedly. And when she did, she would belt out in this powerful voice that would have made Julie Andrews jealous. And uh, for a while, that was kind of funny and amusing, and it got a laugh out of the kids. But over time, this started to get more frustrating. And first, you know, her teacher became more frustrated that you know, the activities she was planning weren't working for this kid. And, uh, and eventually, the kid became frustrated because she was spending more and more time not engaged with the students and more frustrated that things weren't going her way. Um, and the situation deteriorated pretty fast. Um, but luckily, someone came in uh, that had experience and had some uh, fresh ideas and uh, really started providing some structure in the classroom and started teaching about all these little things that I would never have thought to teach uh, a student so smart about um, you know, how to be a student in the classroom. Uh, when a teacher gives certain types of instructions or a certain type of activity, um, what the expectations are for a student in those kinds of things and um, providing reinforcement for it. So, uh, so with these structures and supports, all of a sudden things started to get better. Um, you know, she got more included in her classroom and, uh, and things really started to turn around. And so that kind of stuck with me. Uh, and it's a big part of the reason why I decided to become a special education teacher, um, to kind of work with kids to find solutions that work for them uh, in natural environments and to kind of help them navigate that, that, that part. So let's backtrack a little bit. Uh, let's talk a little bit about kind of why 
uh, we need to, to think about uh, and why this topic of including students with autism in general education classrooms is important. Um, so the first is really just we have more students with autism. Uh, the CDC's recent uh, estimates are one in 68 uh, children um, have a or should be diagnosed with autism. In a lot of public school divisions, including in Virginia, we see about one in 100. Um, so we're not quite at that one in 68 number. And that kind of means two things. Um, it means, one, that we're getting closer. Those are still uh, big increases from what we saw 10 years ago. Um, and we're also seeing a gap between what those estimates are with the CDC and what, uh, what we see in the classroom. And that means there's a lot of students out there that may have autism, that may not have a diagnosis. So as you're uh, listening and, and uh, thinking about the strategies that we talk about today, you know, don't just think about those kids that have an autism label. Also think about other kids that may have certain characteristics that we're going to talk about, that these things may be uh, beneficial to them. And in fact, you know, the, really the emphasis of a lot of the strategies is that these are things that work for all students. And so uh, by implementing them in your classroom, you're not just going to help that one kiddo that's struggling. Uh, it's really going to benefit uh, uh, a lot more broadly. Um, so the second is really that students with autism can succeed outside of self-contained classrooms. I think for a long time, um, when we uh, started to, to learn more about autism, uh, we started to think about it almost as a, a kind of black box of learning. And really, that was very esoteric. It was very, uh, the characteristics were very specific. And only a few people in school divisions really had the knowledge needed to help students with autism learn how to succeed. And over time, I think we've gotten much, much better at, uh, at thinking about how we can provide those supports and strategies and help students with autism to be successful included in their typical peers. And in fact, what we see is that when we can provide those inclusive opportunities, it really has benefits across the board in the lives of students with autism and their peers. Um, and what we see is that students, even when we control for uh, the student characteristics or uh, socioeconomic factors or other indicators, that students who are included in, with their peers in general education have much better outcomes in employment, uh, they have much more access to college, their graduation rates are higher, and they have a higher quality of life as adults. So this is a really important thing uh, that we need to try uh, to provide kids and, and to make sure that that's a meaningful and successful experience for them. Um, and the last thing we need, obviously, if we're going to include uh, more students in the general education uh, setting, is that we need more school staff to be uh, part of a student support team. So it's not really reasonable uh, for us to expect that one person in the school building to be uh, the kind of go-to person for all things autism anymore. We need to kind of spread the wealth and make sure that uh, more people have access to some ideas and ways of thinking about uh, how they can bring their own expertise to support children with autism. Which kind of brings me to, my, to, to a, a favorite saying of mine, uh, and you may have heard it before, uh, if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. And uh, what this really means is that the characteristics and um, the, uh, the different kinds of uh, ways that, that uh, people with autism uh, learn and uh, have preferences and, and everything like that vary so much that it's really hard to generalize that sometimes. Um, and, you know, I think for a long time we thought about autism as a spectrum, right? And we thought about it as a linear spectrum that went from low functioning to high functioning, and those are words that you hear thrown out a lot with autism. But what we're learning more and more is that it's not like that at all, and that if we look at these individual characteristics of autism, from uh, cognitive ability to how folks are impacted by sensory differences, uh, to some of the rigidity uh, that comes with the behavioral component, uh, to the flexibility that, with uh, the kind of uh, social interaction, that really each of these uh, have their own individual spectrum. And so someone can be uh, nonverbal and be very restricted and, and impacted uh, with their communication, but be completely brilliant. And here you see a, a few people, the famous celebrities, that either uh, have a formal diagnosis of autism, like Stephen Wilshire, the artist, or uh, Daryl Hannah, who received an educational label of autism as a student, and was actually in a self-contained class uh, in elementary school, uh, to folks like uh, David Byrne, who have kind of reflected back and uh, self-identified themselves with Asperger's is, uh, later in life, is that you know, the characteristics and the interest and, uh, really differ really greatly from person to person. Um, so 
it's important not to kind of put people with autism in a box as we're thinking about uh, these strategies and inclusion. Um, however, you know, while there's a lot of difference, there are some common things that we, in an educational environment we should kind of keep our eye on and think about and consider when we're planning for uh, including people with autism. And uh, as I said before, these strategies that we're going to talk about really help all students. And, uh, and so as we're uh, kind of planning for these, just keep in mind that these are not things that you need to kind of teach in isolation to one kid, but really try to provide as much as possible to the, to the entire class uh, to benefit all students. So when we're thinking about the commonalities of autism, uh, it makes sense probably to start first at the defining characteristics. And so we diagnose autism based on kind of two things uh, with the recent uh, diagnostic and statistical manual guidelines. And those are social communication and restricted repetitive behavior, uh, which includes now sensory differences within that, that behavior. Um, and so when we look at these, uh, these vary greatly from person to person. Um, so social communication can mean everything from uh, students who have no verbal language and uh, that we would think to provide uh, some additional language supports through an augmentative communication device, all the way up to students that may have um, social skill difficulties and uh, may have you know, be what we call hyperlexic, have huge vocabularies, uh, but have trouble with the subtleties of uh, social interaction and social skills. And the same with behavior. You know, this runs the gamut from uh, folks who uh, are uh, really have an intense need for things to be the same uh, all the time and really have a hard time adapting to those changes to folks that are more flexible that may uh, have some kind of um, motor behaviors uh, like stemming or flapping uh, that, that, uh, that come up from time to time. And as you can see in the, the visual here uh, on your screen, um, this is a map kind of of all of the characteristics. And so um, beyond just the defining ones that may impact uh, some students. And we call these secondary characteristics. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the secondary characteristics that may impact students. But it's important to note that um, while behavior and communica social communication define um, the diagnosis of autism, there are much more um, characteristics that may impact students in a classroom, uh, from sensory to executive functioning to uh, some of the comorbid conditions like anxiety and sleep disorder and eating issues. And one that I want to kind of focus on uh, is executive functioning. Um, and so executive functioning is a brain process, it's a cognitive process, and the metaphor that I like to use is it's almost like an air traffic controller. Um, so an air traffic controller doesn't do the work of flying the plane. So it's not um, a specific cognitive skill in the same way as uh, computation and math is or uh, reading comprehension. But executive functioning is almost overseeing all of those individual processes and coordinating their activity. And so executive functioning is what we draw on uh, to plan out ideas, um, to uh, manage all of the different tasks, to prioritize, uh, to make a lot of interpretation. It's going to it's what we use to kind of draw contextual clues together to make a bigger picture. And so executive functioning has a really important role in, uh, in a lot of what we do, certainly in the learning process, but really just about navigating the world around us. Uh, so this is really important. And another way of thinking of it, there's some researchers at MIT have recently floated an idea of um, really trying to pull together uh, what seems like uh, very different characteristics uh, that, that uh, uh, folks on the, on the autism spectrum have and trying to find kind of a unifying core of it. Um, and so related to this idea of executive functioning and planning, what they've put out there, and again, this is just a theory, is that they've said, you know, really this, this idea of uh, social communication difficulties and repetitive behavior really come down to a difficulty with predicting. Uh, and that's really the common core. And so uh, that difficulty in prediction may happen uh, with not knowing uh, what someone else is feeling or thinking when you're talking to them and how that leads to difficulties and breakdowns with the social interaction that you have with folks. Um, or that, um, that difficulty predicting 
may be about not being able to interpret new situations and kind of figure out what's expected and how if you uh, saw the world as a, a new experience that didn't relate to your previous experience every time, you would probably need things to be as much the same as possible every single time. And when they weren't that way, you might be scared, anxious, uh, and have those kind of feelings that would make it difficult for you to adapt in new situations. Uh, and so this, I think, is, for me, a helpful way to think about um, kind of unifying or, or thinking uh, more clearly about how autism impacts people in these kinds of situations that we come across in the classroom or certainly in the community as well. Uh, and so, as I said, these come up a lot, you know, with these uh, executive functioning challenges or, or difficulties in, in predicting what's going to happen in an environment. As if you think about routines, uh, and this kind of goes both ways. So there's both, I think, a need for routines by individuals with autism, and as much as we can provide clear routines that are predictable, I think that's very much a comfort zone for a lot of people with autism. But there's also uh, sometimes a difficulty in learning those and seeing those uh, embedded within uh, what's sometimes a kind of complicated school day. Uh, so as much as we can make those kind of explicit and clear, and we'll talk about some strategies later on uh, in this webcast about it, I think it's, it's very helpful for students. We talked a little bit about social interaction, but it basically gets down to this idea that if you can't predict what someone is thinking or what's expected in a certain situation um, or seeing when someone is kind of tuned out to what you're saying, it makes that social interaction piece very difficult. Um, and so, you know, a lot of times, you know, our, our uh, uh, students with autism may, uh, may have breakdowns that are related to not being able to kind of figure out uh, what's expected. And so a lot of what we can do is to provide that context, to provide that predictability, uh, to explain the perspective of others, and, uh, and to make those expectations more explicit. Uh, writing is, is a really big one, uh, and writing uh, requires a lot of uh, kind of planning and cognitive processes that are related to executive functioning. And so we'll talk about some writing strategies that are helpful. Um, but really when you think about writing being uh, this sort of uh, mixture of uh, kind of thinking and planning and reflecting and then uh, organizing your thoughts and then you know pulling that from your organizational plan into uh, more of a creative form and then being able to refer back. There's a lot of kind of shifting and executive functioning needed there. Uh, also in group work, you know, uh, group work requires like social interaction, a lot of uh, you know, reading uh, what one person's role is and what other people expect, um, but also kind of shifting and compromising uh, and problem solving as our next one. Um, so problem solving specifically requires us to kind of not only think about a certain situation, but think about the different possibilities that are out there. And if we have difficulty with executive functioning, uh, that only allows us to really take and consider one piece at a time, it's going to be hard to evaluate those multiple options that are out there to come up with a good solution. And so problem solving can be really tricky. Uh, there are some good tips of we, how, ways that we can break down problems for, for students that can be really helpful, and we'll, we'll get to those later. Um, and then reading comprehension. And this one kind of stands out, and I think a lot of people don't think about reading comprehension and how it relates, um, and it often is kind of a surprise for, for teachers and educational teams when they have students with autism who are really strong decoders and really strong readers. And then we get to that point um, in early elementary where we're gonna start to ask some reading comprehension questions and all of a sudden, you know, the, the performance is really different from the strong decoding skills. And I think reading, this reading comprehension also gets to the idea that to be a good uh, uh, comprehender uh, and a good reading, uh, good reader, you have to be able to construct meaning from what you read. And you have to shift between um, ideas within the text to create a bigger picture. And even get into things, there's some research on uh, what they call anaphors, so pronouns, and things that refer back to uh, other uh, ideas or nouns in the text. Our students with autism don't do a very good job of, uh, of anchoring what he or she or it refers to back in the text. So if you're not making those connections, you're losing a lot of those clues that we need to, to, uh, to understand what we're reading. Okay, so um, 
we are going to talk about a lot of different strategies, uh, but I want to kind of frame these with uh, kind of some core principles that I think are really important regardless of what we do, because by no means is this an extensive list of strategies that are helpful, and I don't want anyone to come away thinking that uh, Josh said you have to do X, Y, and Z and uh, nothing else. Um, so, you know, I think when we think about how um, these differences with kids with autism uh, impact them in a, in a learning environment, um, a lot of what we do is filling in those gaps where our guys have difficulty in planning and predicting, uh, where they have difficulty kind of uh, uh, understanding things from a context. And so, you know, no surprise here, we want to be really explicit in, in the way that we give instruction, uh, in the way that we frame behavioral expectations for kiddos. Um, we also want to give a lot of context at times when it's appropriate. Um, and this doesn't necessarily mean overwhelming and having to, you know, over explain everything that we do, but it does mean when, when students are entering kind of a novel environment, um, and maybe it's, maybe it's providing an inclusive opportunity for the first time. And so a kiddo is moving from uh, has ha only had experience or had most of their educational experience in the self-contained classroom, and you're moving them into a general education classroom, giving context of what's expected in those different parts of the class is really important to uh, giving them what they need to be able to follow those routines uh, without you know, putting them in a situation where they're having to uh, deduce what's expected, uh, and our guys aren't very good at that a lot of the time. A lot of it's providing structure, um, and so whether that's uh, within a, a certain academic task, whether it's within uh, sort of the environment itself, um, providing structure is a really helpful way for our guys to kind of anchor uh, their understanding and then kind of build from there. And right in, in hand with that is creating predictable routines. Um, so as much as we can um, make the, the classroom space sort of intuitive uh, as far as what's, what's to expect, uh, what's to be expected from students. I think it's going to help them kind of hit the ground running and really be able to focus on learning rather than figuring out what I'm supposed to do. Uh, giving choices is really important. I think we forget about this one sometimes when we think about structure, structure, structure. Um, but within that structure, there's got to be flexibility, right? If we're only providing this uh, structured bubble, for our kids with autism and never giving them an opportunity to make choices, to learn about unexpected changes, um, to build in these more natural things, then I think we're doing a disservice and not really preparing kids for, for graduation, for more inclusive experiences in their communities, uh, and for building these kind of skills. Um, and then finally, just using motivation and reinforcement. And this is you know, a core principle of teaching for all kids, but it's very important with our students with autism as well. Um, and it's important to think about that that motivation and that reinforcement may look different from that of a typical student. So it's important to kind of know your student and really tap into their specific interests and what kind of drives them. So, you know, again, we'll kind of break down what we talk about into three uh, kind of phases or three ways of thinking about it. And so the first uh, I call planning for inclusion, and that's really the um, in some ways, the, the stuff the grown-ups have to do before the kids get to the classroom. So it's kind of what we have to do behind the scenes to make sure that uh, we're kind of building a foundation for success. The second part is going to be preparing for success. And so these are going to be mostly proactive strategies that we can provide um, you know, within the context of what we do um, to try to make sure that that's beneficial and helpful for students as they're engaging with whatever activity or whatever curriculum uh, uh, or experience is happening in those classrooms. And the third part's problem solving. And so drawing from what we, what we know about uh, kiddos with autism and the differences in the way that they interact and see uh, uh, the, those classroom experiences, how can we provide some structure and some strategies for working through those issues that come up? The first thing to think about, and, and absolutely the most important, when we're planning for uh, including, including our students with autism uh, in general education environments, is the saying, later is never. Um, and this is true whether we're thinking about uh, a school and classroom environment, or uh, certainly it's uh, the same thing that, that uh, Dr. Wayman and the other pioneers of supported employment found uh, working on the employment side, is that if we wait uh, to build up prerequisite skills, uh, we're going to miss out on opportunities to provide practice and uh, to build success uh, for our students or, uh, or adults uh, with autism uh, to be able to, to kind of learn uh, those skills within natural environments. 
Um, so instead of kind of saying like there's a list of uh, skills that you need to have before you can benefit from it, what we need to do instead is to provide those experiences and then provide support around them. And that's what our kind of job is, is to, to fill those gaps uh, in, in where uh, students may need support um, uh, to make sure that they are able to uh, kind of engage in that environment and, and for it to be a meaningful experience. The second is collaboration and co-planning. Um, and this is really important. You know, this is the way that we, uh, we've become so specialized in education. And it's really essential that we share each of our uh, different kind of areas of expertise, whether it's content from the gen ed teacher, a related service provider providing a specific angle on uh, you know, the, the needs and accommodations of a student and the special education teacher filling in with those strategies and accommodations. Um, it's really important that we get together and kind of plan out what uh, that experience is going to look like before a kid gets into the classroom. Um, and so from my experiences working in a more inclusive setting in a high school, um, that was really kind of getting with each teacher uh, to kind of plan out, to see what their instruction is, what's the sequence, where are the pieces where uh, we may need more support, and to kind of plan those logistics. Um, whereas for uh, my uh, kiddos coming out of a self-contained class uh, that were uh, making the jump into, uh, into an inclusive setting there, it was really about looking at kind of their scope and sequence to, uh, to really make that alignment between uh, the standards of learning that they were using and the ASOLs that, uh, that our, uh, our, our students were working on. And so it may look different, but it's a really critical piece for, for any kind of plan for inclusion. And part and parcel with this is the communication. So in addition to kind of get together, getting together and collaborating, it's really important to have an ongoing way uh, for sharing what's happening, sharing what works, uh, if there's any kind of buildup, frustration, or difficulty getting in front of it and knowing about it early, um, and really just making sure that uh, there is some level of kind of data that's taken and shared. Uh, and parents need to be in this loop too. Uh, parents are a big part of our, our team and can give us uh, indicators uh, of what's happening at home, what's worked in the past, and so they definitely need to be in this communication loop as well. One of the most important things when we're planning for inclusion is, is having high expectations. Um, some of what the, the research literature shows is that one of the, uh, the best indicators of how successful a student will be um, with accessing uh, uh, college and post-secondary education, with getting and, keeping, getting and keeping a job after graduation, is the expectations of their teachers and their parents. Um, even when we control for other factors like IQ scores or uh, characteristics that may interfere with learning or SES, um, even so these expectations follow through as a really strong predictor. And the takeaway from that is really that if we can provide challenging experiences and uh, keep a high bar for our students, whether it's selecting coursework um, that you know is really going to kind of push them and be challenging and difficult, but uh, you know, provide an experience where they have access to that, uh, that can be a really important way to kind of get a foothold towards um, some of these better outcomes that we're, we're working towards, uh, I think, as, a, as a, a system. So a great resource uh, for planning and thinking about uh, making the alignment between functional skills um, and, and general education inclusive classroom opportunities, I'm really going to recommend a colleague's uh, webinar. Uh, Cindy Petoniak has done uh, two webcasts so far on uh, inclusion, and she has some wonderful tools that are really helpful at making those connections between uh, working on skills that are in students' IEPs that are really um, concrete, meaningful, functional skills. I mean, kind of how do we align that with all the demands and rigor of a general education environment and uh, SOL instruction and DD or test and how do we look at um, the, the planning matrices that we can really match those up and align those together. Um, so I've got the link here. I really encourage you to check it out. Uh, it's uh, wonderful stuff and uh, really is, is an important way that you can make that first step to kind of getting kids uh, uh, in positions where they're they're working on skills that are they're meaningful that have been determined by their IEP teams to lead to better transition outcomes while also making sure that they're there with their typical peers and, and included in those classes.
Um, so yeah, so that's, uh, those are the things that I would recommend thinking about when you're planning for inclusion is uh, one, just getting out there and doing it, putting kids in situations uh, where they're around typical peers and planning supports uh, based on that, collaboration with, uh, with other uh, staff members and with parents and finding a way to communicate with them is really important, keeping those high expectations and making sure that you know, you're not trying to do an either or between uh, challenging uh, academic instruction and those, that kind of functional skill instruction. But you can do both, uh, but it does require some creative planning that uh, Cindy's webcast can then help you out with. So now we shift to preparing for success. And so this is really thinking about strategies that you would use uh, when a student arrives in the classroom or just before, things you want to have in place when they, when they do arrive. And so the first and one of the most important is really establishing in your classroom um, a positive and welcoming climate uh, to welcome the student with autism. And so obviously this is going to look very different between ages um, and, uh, and between settings, but really it's about um, talking to the peers about, um, about autism and about differences that, they, that may be encountered, but in a positive way that's really welcoming to the student and really provides uh, a context and a climate where they feel welcome and included in that classroom. Um, and this can be really important, especially when we um, you know, are looking at providing inclusive opportunities for students that are accessing adaptive curriculum uh, that may be coming in and working on a different uh, kind of uh, uh, type of instruction. Uh, that people, or the students in the classroom see those students, even if they're working on something different, as part of the community of a classroom. And uh, one of the, the best resources that I uh, know of to, talk, to, to use as a, uh, as a structure for this is the Organization for Autism Research's uh, Kit for Kids, or What's Up with Nick Curriculum. And uh, I really encourage you to, to Google it, check it out. It's, uh, they have uh, materials for your classroom. Um, if you email them, they'll probably even send you some stuff, that you, posters you can put up on your wall. They now have a video series that you can watch. And really, this curriculum is all about uh, talking about autism in a way that uh, talks about those differences but emphasizes the, the positive nature of thinking about things differently or going about things in a, in a different way than other students and uh, is a great way to start the conversation uh, about autism and disability within classrooms uh, in a positive way. The, uh, the second one I want to talk about that really is a fundamental um, strategy that has a lot of uh, separate strategies that we use to to implement it is priming um, and priming is really how we um, provide that prediction to a student so as we talked about before uh, we know our folks with autism have difficulty predicting what's going to happen in different kinds of contexts so priming just really gets it we're going to find some way of letting them know what's coming up down the road um, and so it can be done in a lot of different ways um, but uh, one of them is, uh, and one of the most important, is an individual schedule. Uh, and I would really go as far to say that an individual schedule is something that, in some form or fashion, every student with autism needs to have. Um, it needs to be uh, individual, so it needs to be different from a class schedule. So you may have a class schedule, but a student with autism needs, at some level, some kind of individual schedule that they can follow through uh, that's specific to them, um, that's adaptable, so it needs to include things that may change. So if you have a Tuesday schedule, but on the third Tuesday of every month there's an assembly and everything changes, then there needs to be a schedule for that third Tuesday of every month when everything changes because of the assembly that's specific and up to date. If it's not, it's, it's not helpful anymore and it's just going to cause conflicts. Um, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about the unexpected, but uh, an individual schedule is a good way to kind of anchor the understanding of what's going to come up next. Uh, it also needs to be portable, so it needs to go with a student where they go, um, because you know we know that you know uh, these things follow a student, and so having something where they can refer to and stay on track is really helpful. Uh, and it also needs to kind of match up and align with a student's uh, comprehension level and their age. So we don't want to be using cartoon characters with a high school kid, but we also don't want to use kind of a written Google Calendar, um, you know, for a kindergartner who hasn't quite mastered kind of reading comprehension. So 
we want to look at different ways that we can use visuals, we can use pictures, we can use real objects even with some of our younger students um, uh, to provide a schedule that kind of keeps students on track and lets them know what's going to come up next. And uh, so a good strategy to use in conjunction with a, an individual written schedule is a quick check-in. And so a quick check-in is going to uh, use um, just kind of a quick huddle up or it can be a chat just to kind of um, review kind of what's coming up next. And it's a good way to, to use a visual schedule and we can uh, kind of point to some of those things that are happening to either uh, indicate maybe something that's changed on the schedule and so maybe we're having to make a switch and kind of correct a schedule with a student. It may be to kind of coach the expectations. And so let's say PE is a trouble spot. We know PE is going to come up next. So we want to use that time to kind of review what are the strategies that we're going to use in PE. These are the rules in PE. We need to stay in the room. We need to do this. These are some self-regulation strategies. When we're in PE, you can take a break. You can take breaths. You know, you know this is going to happen. Um, and also just to kind of debrief about how things went. So it's a good kind of check-in in the middle of the day maybe, especially for kiddos that are maybe moving between different classrooms in the school to have that time to say like, well, how did things go in math? Did you get that turned in? Make sure that you have your homework folder with you uh, next period, these kinds of things. A really, really important one, and it kind of goes back to that idea of not creating too much of a bubble, is that we need to teach the unexpected. So even though our, our guys with autism uh, benefit from having structure and predictability, the, the real world doesn't always have predictability and structure. And so it's a big part of our job as teachers uh, to teach that unexpected. Um, and so we can do this in a way that's structured, even though we're kind of preparing them for something that's unstructured. And so, you know, that individual schedule, I go back to that, is a great place to start. Uh, we can introduce the unexpected things gradually and in a way that uh, engages students in that. And so one strategy I like to use is um, first naming it. So you can say it's an unexpected thing or you can say it's something wacky um, and have it have an icon, have it have a line on the schedule um, and let students know that it's coming up but don't tell them what it is. And maybe at the beginning you're going to start with something that's really reinforcing. Uh, maybe the wacky thing is uh, they're going to get to have lunch with uh, their favorite person in the school or they get to listen to a song that they really like for five minutes. Um, and then slowly introduce kind of more neutral things uh, until you have a, kind of an understanding that you know, some, sometimes wacky things happen and they get mixed in with it. And it gives kind of a way of talking about and thinking about unexpected changes that come up that don't seem so threatening for someone that uh, maybe has uh, difficulty adjusting to those changes at first. Uh, so that can be really helpful. And then also kind of building in some strategies when something unexpected does happen, you know, if, if I feel anxious, uh, then I can request a break. I can, you know, ask to talk to somebody and find out what's going to happen next. I can ask questions for the person in charge, these kinds of ideas. Um, social narratives are a big one, and you might also hear them called social stories sometimes. And uh, basically they're using a narrative form to talk about, you know, what's expected in a certain situation, uh, what the perspective of others are, um, and what the context is. And uh, you'll find lots of resources out there on social narratives. I don't want to spend too much time on it today, but something I really encourage you to check out. This was a very useful strategy for my guys coming out of a self-contained classroom to really go into a bigger general education class for the first time um, to know kind of what's expected in certain things that may be really unfamiliar for them uh, to kind of anchor that to something where I could show a picture within that narrative and I could talk about the things that other students might say to them and think and how they could respond. So it literally lets you kind of create um, a story that represents the whole picture of a certain experience that can be really helpful for our guys that have trouble creating that big picture on their own. Um, the next part is really just talking about how we provide structure uh, in our task and, and explicit instruction, uh, explicit expectations uh, for kiddos. So I'll talk about a few different ways that we can do that. Um, you know, graphic organizers are a great way to do it. Having predictable routines within academic sessions are a great way to do that. Um, we want things, uh, activities that students are engaged in to be intuitive in some ways, not too complex where they have to kind of read through written instructions. Uh, worksheets are your enemy, I would say, when you're thinking about structuring things. Um, 
uh, it can really be a trouble spot for a lot of our, our kids. Um, so the first part is we want to kind of break complex tasks into steps or chunks. Um, and this works really well for writing, uh, where you know when you think about what it takes to be a good writer and to be effective, uh, you really have a lot of different steps to that process from the time you get to an idea uh, to sort of cultivate it and, and, and break it down into different parts to make sure that those flow together and have transitions, to then execute it. And so if we can break down those steps uh, to writing or to whatever activity those are, we can uh, allow our, our kids to focus on one part at a time, uh, which allows them to kind of work within their comfort zone and doesn't get them into that, those problems with executive functioning that may lead to breakdowns in that process uh, where they have trouble shifting between those ideas. Uh, task analysis is a, is a great way to do this, and that's just going to be really just giving a step-by-step -step instruction of what's expected in, within a certain sequence. Um, we can also provide mini schedules within an activity. So, you know, a schedule may say English class, but uh, a mini schedule might talk about the individual parts of that English class. Along with this, we want to be really clear in the instructions that we give. We want to use visuals, uh, possibly use models and show what a finished product is going to look like. Um, and these can work in conjunction with, uh, with other strategies so we can you know, provide really explicit instructions in a task analysis. And then don't be afraid to give context where needed, especially with social skills. Um, you know, we don't want to uh, over inundate with too much detail, uh, but we also want to provide students with an understanding of you know, the perspective of others within something. And if something is complicated, um, or has subtleties to when we do a certain behavior, uh, whether it's uh, greeting or apologizing or um, you know, uh, any kind of process, we don't want to oversimplify it to where students are just going to do the same thing over and over and it may get them into trouble, right? Um, so building in those understandings from the beginning is really important. One of my favorite ways uh, in classrooms to provide structure and, uh, and routines is uh, using rotations um, and routines. So um, this really requires us to think about um, the different parts of kind of what we do within a class period and breaking it down into steps that are really clear and uh, thinking about the way that we're going to share information at that point. Are we going to share information visually? Are we going to share information in more of an experiential learning kind of group work? Are we going to share experience uh, through reading? And what's expected of the student within those routines or stations? Um, and so you can, just as an example, think about a seventh grade history class uh, that's really, you know, that maybe that's an hour long block that's broken down into, into three parts. And so each of those parts now is more manageable. So an hour is a long time to expect uh, a lot of students in seventh grade and certainly a student with autism to attend to kind of one way of receiving information. But if we can break it down into chunks where maybe in one station they're reading and just kind of uh, receiving information, um, maybe in one there's more of a group discussion where there's an expectation when, the, when you're in that part of the classroom, when you're in that station, uh, regardless of what the discussion's about, the expectations are that we listen to other people, that we take turns, uh, that we share our ideas, and then maybe there's another station, another part of the room, it's always in that part of the room, there's anticipation that this vocabulary may change, but the, the context of that vocabulary game, when it comes up, there's a sequence that is uh, easily uh, remembered and, and, and uh, recalled. Um, and then we want to explicitly teach social skills. And this is another really big one. You'll find a lot of good uh, webcasts on our website about different models of delivering social skills, uh, different ways that we do it for different age groups. And this really runs the gamut from teaching kind of initial play and joint attention skills all the way up to dating and managing complex relationships with uh, peers and teachers and everything like that and even self-regulation. Um, so I don't want to get too into that, but just to, to make sure that this is something uh, where it's considered for all students um, on, with autism and it's done in a way that's uh, meaningful and in natural context that can generalize to, uh, to what we want them to. And then we also kind of along with uh, social skill instruction is we want to think about how we can provide opportunities for students to 
uh, self-monitor their own behavior. And so again, this may look different at different ages uh, and uh, with different kids, um, but technology is a really powerful way that we can do this. You know, we see with the, the Fitbit revolution, so to speak, um, you know, people having access to technology that, that gives them insight into their own behavior so that they can change it. And it's the same for our kiddos with autism. If we can identify the behavior that we, that we and they want to see out of themselves and provide those check-ins to, hey, am I doing what I should be doing? Uh, let me monitor that and try to make progress on my own. That can be really helpful. Um, and so with younger kids, that may look more like a token economy. Uh, but the important thing is really to be very clear about identifying what the goal is. Uh, and for that goal to be something that's meaningful both to the teacher, obviously, but also to the kiddo, too, so that they're part of that process and see why they're doing something in addition to just getting reinforcement for it. Uh, and the last one is uh, really to provide kind of a home base and break cards. Um, you know, some of the, the, the uh, length of uh, activities that we have in general education classrooms uh, and just the process can be kind of overwhelming. And so giving opportunities to uh, both within the environment and kind of a home base within the classroom that's set up to be a calming area uh, where students can, uh, all students, not just our guys in the spectrum, can access those uh, to kind of self-regulate and get themselves into a space for learning uh, and to provide a process for requesting breaks that's um, conducive and, and feasible within the classroom. Um, and really the, the most important thing here is that this should be a positive way for students to um, access their own self-regulation and not as a punishment or as a seclusion. And it should always be a choice of the student um, or with the student rather than a go, go to your timeout or go to your uh, home base. That that's, we know that that's not effective. Uh, so we talked about a lot of things here. So, you know, really, you know, thinking about the themes within it, uh, a lot of priming or giving prediction of what's going to happen next through um, all of those different strategies, social narratives and schedules and check-ins, and then structuring tasks through kind of breaking them up, chunking them, giving explicit instructions and context where needed, and to kind of build those routines within a classroom environment so students know uh, what they need to succeed. And the last part we're going to talk about is problem solving. And so if we think back, and we touched on a little bit at the beginning, of those cognitive differences in students with autism, um, problem solving can be a difficult one, right? Um, if we're only able to kind of deal with one situation at a time and can't take into account those different contexts or different outcomes of uh, different solutions of working through a problem, it's really hard to evaluate how we would um, choose the best one, right? And so as a result, a lot of our times our um, uh, Lauren Kinworthy and her colleagues, uh, who've done a lot of work and research in this and have some curricula on it, uh, talk about getting stuck. Uh, and so getting stuck uh, means kind of not being able to find a way out of it, of a situation. And, you know, with that comes a lot of anxiety and frustration over a, a problem that doesn't go away and keeps coming back. And so that can be really difficult for a lot of students and could lead to some of the behaviors that we see in students when they do get frustrated and can lead to meltdowns or lead to um, even simple things where something doesn't go exactly the way it seems and all of a sudden it's, uh, it's a big kind of uh, uh, behavior that, uh, that seems to come out of nowhere. A lot of the times I think it comes from these, these stuck moments. Uh, and uh, Dr. Kinworthy and her, her team talk a little bit about uh, can't versus won't, that it's really a lot of times the behavior that we see from students when they run into problems is more of a skill deficit rather than a, than a kind of um, um, uh, willful uh, disobedience. And as teachers, the takeaway from this is first and foremost, we want to avoid a power struggle. Um, so we want to kind of provide ways and strategies for students to help work their way out of these issues rather than trying to get into a, a uh, power struggle we're demanding a uh, certain type of action. And so there's a lot of different strategies that we can use to work through different kinds of problems. And a lot of these, um, again, come from Dr. Kim Worthy's work, but really are cognitive behavior strategies that are used not just with kiddos with autism, but in a lot of different 
um, ways of thinking about problems that we run into as individuals and how we can think differently about them to find solutions. Um, and so compromise is one of these. You know, we can get frustrated when things don't fit our expectations, but how can we work to identify the things that are most important and find a compromise that, that suits two people? And this can be really helpful with a teacher and a student or two students. Uh, the next is how big of a deal is it? And this works well with a, a five-point scale. And so a uh, five-point scale kind of breaks down from one to five, how intense something is or how big of a deal it is. And we can talk about, you know, something may feel like a four where it's, you know, got to go home, can't deal with it, you know, the police are about to be called. But really, when, I th when we think about it, it's really a two. Um, so it's a little bit of a frustration, but we can work through it. And so starting to give some language about thinking about how big problems are, because in the moment, if you're unable to kind of do that shifting and planning with executive functioning, things can seem to have a lot more weight and gravity than they, than they probably deserve. But the next is kind of, do I get to choose? You know, is something a choice or not? Uh, not everything is, is a choice. Some things are, uh, but some things are just things that we have to do. And that's where providing that context uh, that we talked about can be helpful uh, to really think about uh, why we do some of the things that we do that we don't necessarily have a choice over and how they fit into everything else. Uh, being flexible and reinforcing it is really important. Um, you know, we, uh, if we can remain flexible, there's a lot of problems that we can work through. Uh, and as much as we can reinforce that characteristic and that way of thinking about our guys can really be helpful at them learning the skills to, to be successful on their own. And then the last one is making a plan. And, um, there's a lot of ways that we can kind of structure that process going back to uh, social autopsy from, from many years ago and just kind of providing a graphic organizer for breaking down, you know, what went wrong, what needs to change, uh, you know, what could, what could be done to repair the situation um, or any other way to kind of break down and diagnose what's happening in a situation and, and what needs to, um, what strategies can we use to, to, to fix it. Um, because as much as we can kind of chunk and provide um, that in writing or in visuals, um, allow students to think about one piece at a time without stressing them about pulling all those pieces together, which we know is challenging. And that's it. So um, I hope you found this, uh, this talk helpful uh, in talking about you know, some of the strengths of our learners with autism, as well as some of the areas that we need to kind of be mindful of that may be a challenge for them in the classroom and some ways that we can uh, help with that, uh, both in the planning with the other grown-ups in the school and making sure that everything is set up for their success, as well as providing those proactive strategies and working through problems that come up within it. Uh, so my email is here on the slides. If you'd like to uh, uh, drop me a line, give me some feedback, ask any questions, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much.